Okie dokie. We are now recording. All right, so this week, um, I'll be honest with you, this topic, this week will bend your brain, okay? Yeah, it, it, will, it will bend your brain a little bit because it's, it's, um, it deals with inheritance, polymorphism, and object-oriented object -orient, object programming, okay? And you're going to deal with things this week like uh, a brand new class type called the record. And you're also going to look at interfaces and what else? Um, what is the topic of that thing called? Abstract classes. There's something else it's called. Uh, hang on real quick here. Look at my notes. It is going to hit me in a minute, and I'm going to feel silly that I didn't remember this. <laughs> Lambdas. Lambdas. Okay, so we're going to talk about um, we're going to talk about first of all polymorphism. Okay. And let's talk about it from the perspective of, of animals. Now, I'm going to do this strictly by example today. I'm not going to go through the PowerPoint slides. Um, I just want to go strictly by example of what, by, a pro, by programming example, what polymorphism is. So in this instance, I want you to go ahead and... Um, create a Java class, and we're going to call it an animal, okay? Yes? Well, I, I'm not. This is a class. The class itself is just animal, as in singular. The project itself is called animals, okay? All right. So, let's, let's, Talk briefly about an animal. What do animals do? What do animals have? Um, legs are a good place to begin, right? Most, all animals, well, unless you're talking about insects, right? Or fish. We're not going to deal with insects, okay? Uh, let's just keep it simple for right now. But let's talk about, um, let's make it even more specific. We're going to refactor this and call it um, mammals. I don't want to be a speciesist here and, you know. Spell it for me. I had um, I had a brain fart. <laughs> Sorry, was that was that contraceptive? No. Okay. I literally all of a sudden could not remember how to spell mammal. Okay. All right, here we go. So um, mammals have. Uh, they usually have a fur color, right? They have eyes. Mammals, whales are mammals. They have fur, believe it or not. Okay, uh, let's go by generalization. Okay, so let's um, let's go by fur, fur color. So we'll do private string fur color. Let's do another one, private, string. What's something else that a mammal has, all mammals have? Milk. Let's, let's not, I don't want to deal with milk yet. 
Um, how about eye color? Okay. Just be simple. All right. For our purposes here, we're going to um, just go ahead and go down to generate. We're going to create a getter and a setter. <coughs> Click OK. OK. All right, so this is a mammal. Now, Let's create another class, and we'll call this um, a dog class. Okay. And um, a dog, what's different about a dog compared to a mammal? They bark. Yes, they bark, but that's more of an action. What's different? <coughs> Let's, some, one of you back there, I, I, is that Elijah who said that? They have a tail? Yeah, tail. Okay. Um, let's just say tail, let's see, int tail length. Okay. And again, I'm going to do a generate. Give it. I'm right clicking, going to generate on the menu option here. Wait, right click. Uh huh. Someone show Elijah so I don't have to keep stopping there. Okay. All right, so now I have a mammal and I have a dog. Now let's pause and think about the hierarchy. Would you all say that a dog is a mammal? Would you say a cat is a mammal? Yes. Yeah. Would you say a monkey is a mammal? Yes. Would you say a whale is a mammal? Yes. Wait, what are we generating? Just strings or just Elijah, just go ahead and ask someone else real quick there so I can kind of, this is important. Okay? All right. A dog, a cat, all of these um, are examples they inherit from, right, in real life. We can see, generationally speaking, that there is some type of hierarchy that defines these species. And we can, we can look at it as a parent-child relationship, not necessarily because of evolution, but there's some type of relationship that we can say all of these types have these general specifications. And we're saying they all have a fur color, they all have an eye color, right? Those are general specifications. Now, um, inheritance in this fashion, the dog, by virtue of being a mammal, automatically gets a fur color and a eye color. But how do we specify that in Java? The primary way of specifying inheritance in Java is to say, um, this class extends from mammal. And so now, if um, I'm going to create another class here, okay? And this class, we're going to call uh, the mammal. information class, okay? That's, I'm just calling it that for right now. You can call it whatever you want to call it. I'm going to put a public static void main method in. Remember PSVM will get you that quickly. And if I look at a dog class, and I call it my dog, equals new dog. I'm instantiating that class, and if I do something like my dog dot, look what 
methods I get automatically. I only specify tail length and what? Tail length and something else. Yeah, it was only tail length, right? I only specified tail length, but IntelliJ is picking up that dog also has these other attributes, eye color and fur color, okay? It's, it's automatically inheriting those attributes. So inheritance kind of becomes a powerful mechanism because let's say that the, um, the next uh, class I create is another mammal, right? Another mammal type. Well, let's, let's make this a little bit more useful. Let's add another inside of our mammal class. We're going to do private string name. Okay? Wait, what did we then you generate some inferior logic? Um, Elijah, you, you're going to right click on a free space in the screen inside the class. You're going to click. Yes, Elijah. Okay. L listen, if you have questions, why don't we get, get to it afterwards so we can keep the lecture going here, okay? All right. So I have created this private string name. Um, and for the sake of this, of retrieving it, I'm only going to uh, generate a just a getter here, okay? All right. Again, all I'm doing is I'm right-clicking, going to generate, and I'm selecting getter, and then selecting the item that I only want to generate. Okay. Otherwise, you can type this out yourself: public stream get name return name. Now, for my mammal, I want a way of setting that name. Okay. And the primary way of setting it would be through a constructor. So. To create a constructor, I'll say mammal, and I'm going to supply a parenthesis and the curly brackets. Okay, that is the constructor, and inside of the constructor, I'm going to give the parameter of name, and I'm going to say this name equals name. Okay. All right. Now, for most of you, it's going to show, IntelliJ is going to catch this and say, hey, there's a problem because you use another class and you're not using that constructor. And that's true. Uh, over here, when I created this dog, because I extend from mammal, I also have to create a constructor now that matches the parent. So I'm going to say dog, string name. And I'm going to do super name. Now think about that. What does super reference? Yeah, it re super rep references the super type. What is the super type of a dog? Mammal, right? All right, so I still have, there's still an error here, and that's going to be over in our our mammal information class. And here it's saying, well, you have the, you specify the constructor, but you don't provide the parameter. So in this instance, I'm going to supply for my dog, I'm going to call it, um, let's call it, what is a nice breed of dog? Oh, I like Booney. Booney. All right. All right, so I have, I'm going to change the name of my variable as well because I, I just think it makes sense to match the name if I'm going to do that. So I'm going to call this <coughs> Booney Dog, okay? All right, so now if I go to Dog and I click on this, right, it's going to take me to the constructor for Dog, which is here, and I pass the variable into the super, and if I click on super, I'm going to the mammal. Okay? So this is inheritance. Okay? This is inheritance. So let's create a new animal. 
We're going to right click, say new, Java class, and we're going to call this a cat. And I'm going to say cat extends from mammal. I wouldn't say cat extends from dog, right? Because that just, that just doesn't make sense. But I would say it extends from mammal. And IntelliJ is going to immediately complain because I have to implement the constructor for that, that super type, which is mammal. Okay? So you could do it two ways. You could right click, go to generate, right, and then select constructor, and it'll automatically do the same thing. Or you can just type public cat, or you can just say cat. Okay? Now there is a difference here that we um, that we can observe. And that is that the constructor itself does not have a um, an access modifier on it. Right? And remember your access modifiers control the type of information, how you hide it, how it's made visible. All right, so let's, let's just go back over here to our mammal information. Actually, let's go back to our, our cat first, I'm sorry. Um, private uh, string whisk, uh, hang on. Private int. I'm doing this as I go, so you all bear with me. I'm trying to think of the right parameter here. Let's do, yeah, private int whisker length. Okay? And um, I'm going to generate. getters and setters, okay? So I have a cat that extends mammal that has a whisker length and cat by virtue of being a mammal, it's going to have uh, those other types, right, available to it. Okay, so I go to my mammal over here and I say cat. What is your all's favorite kind of cat? <laughs> I'm so tempted. I am. I'm going to do it. <laughs> I'm a cat. All right. Oops. We had a cat that had many other cats, and that cat had other cats. And um, the first cat we had was given to my daughter. And um, she couldn't figure out a name for the cat. And so my son said, she's small. I'm just going to call her small cat. <laughs> and that name stuck. And so we'd come home and go, come here, small cat. Small cat. Um, how do your visitors like, react? Huh? How do your visitors, visitors like, react when you call your cat? She didn't care. And then, anyway, small cat got bigger, but we still call her small cat. And she had a bunch of cats, and they named one Mo. They named, they named another one Larry. There was a white one that just whined all the time, so we called her Sally. All right. Crybaby Sally? Okay. Yeah. Anyways, okay. Back to our, our topic here. So we have a boonie dog that is, right, these all inherit from, um, from these, these items. Now, here are some interesting things you can do. You could do a mammal, my mammal equals new dog. And, um, um, we just call it short dog. Um, your mammal is the female. We 
Okay. Here's the interesting thing, though. What happens to the variable my mammal? It doesn't have the attributes of dog, does it? Well, the reason is, is because a mammal is a dog, right? Or is it not? This is like the idea of, of shapes. We could say... We, yeah. We could say a square is a rectangle, but a rectangle is not a square. Now, by doing it this way, we only get access to these, these variables, right? Which is kind of strange. What happens if we do it the other way? Dog, crazy dog equals new mammal. We see it complains, right? Because a dog, although carries on the general attributes of a mammal, you can't assign it to it because uh, it expects that the implementation. Let's think. It, you gotta. You gotta think about this. The implementation is going to create those sub variables. So. As soon as you use that constructor, you know what that is, right? Uh, yeah, it's RAM. <laughs> so as soon as you use that constructor annotation, it's going to take up some place over here in RAM. The problem is, mammal, if I use this to try to create a dog, dog has uh, this other variable, and it, it doesn't work. It's like, I need you to assign this variable, but the constructor that creates it can't because it's not going to exist in memory. Make sense? So Java actually protects you in that sense of creating the object in memory. Whereas if you do it the other way, mammal to dog, everything exists here to create, to set aside the variables in memory. Everything exists plus more. But the only, because this is a linkage to it, we don't get access to, what was it, the, the tail length. We don't have access to this because the variable itself doesn't have the connection to it, even though it exists now in memory. Am I making sense? Yes. Okay. This is very important because as you create it in Java, as soon as that constructor is called, it's created in memory. It takes up space in memory on your, on your computer's RAM. If, if we had the ability to open up with a microscope and look in there and see it, we would go, oh, yeah, yeah, here's the ones and zeros that specify this object created in memory, right? Okay, so this is inheritance. Let's... Um, Let's take this a step further. Let's go back now and create a new Java class. And this Java class is going to be an interface. And this one we really are going to call an animal. Okay. Now, animal, 
um, is going just to have a, um, a general method that we're going to create, which is called speak. Sure. Click on source, right click, go to new, click on Java class, select interface, and then type in the name that I, I provided. Okay? Everyone with me so far? Okay. Let's, what's different about this class? It's just an interface. And you all might be going, okay, what does that mean? Right? Let's, let, let's define it like this. An interface is to a job. Let's see. An interface is to an implementation what a contract is to a job. Or a a contract is to a position. Think about it this way. Uh, you go to apply for a job and you see a contract, you see a job specification that's out there. And that job specification, if you get it, is the contract. You're going to do this, you're going to do that, you will be serving this position. It specifies everything that you will do. Then when you get on the job, you implement everything specified in that contract. Does that make sense? So I have a contract here called Animal, and it has one action, speak. All animals speak, don't they? Right? It's the interface is the contract that now that, that has to be implemented. Okay. How do I tie this to my mammal, my cat, my dog? Well, um, a cat and a dog both extend from mammal. And the reason they extend from them is because they're both objects. Okay? They're both... They're both uh, uh, fully completed classes. Okay. The keyword we use for for a class that is going to be using objects from another class in this instance, where is is a is the relationship type is called extends. Okay. So I could say my dog extends mammal, and I could say it. implements animal. Well, I'm sorry, I got the, it's not in the right spot. Let's put it right here. Okay? Hang on, I put it in the wrong spot again. Okay, here we go. Now there's one problem here. When I say it's going to implement something, I have to implement the contract. So for my dog, I could say that my dog is going to now have a public void speak method. And my dog is going to bark. Hang on, did I do this wrong? There we go. I had it in the wrong spot. Okay. So you're you're going to put implements at, at the very end. Okay. That's my, my mistake. But now I'm implementing the animal method. I have to really do that. I have to implement, provide an implementation of what that method is. Now I'm going to click back on the animal class for a second. This is just a contract. And in the programming world, we call it an interface. Okay? 
It is a completely abstract class. And with abstract classes, this by default, all its methods are abstract. Okay? Now there is a catch with interfaces. You can have what's called a default method. Uh, back when Java was still younger, like Java 8, I think it is, or Java 7, uh, you couldn't provide a default method that had a full, a full uh, implemented method logic in it. Uh, we'll, we'll get into those in a minute, default methods. But this is an abstract method, okay? So this is abstract. So let's go back and look at um, the dog class. And before I do, does everyone understand what abstract means? It's, it's intangible. It's, it's not specific. It is just the contract, right? It's like you go into some of those AI um, art websites and you say, draw me a picture of this. You give it the contract, it's abstract what you're typing down, and then it implements it for you. It, it makes it complete. All right, so we're going to go back to our dog class. And so now we have the speak method added. We'll go to our cat class, and we, have, we would have to do it again, right? Because cats, they have a speak method, right? Well, let's, let's think about this. What would make more sense? Would I want to implement it here, or would I want the mammal to implement it? Yeah. I, w I would rather the mammal implement the class, right? Uh, it would make it easier for me to have both the dog and the cat to have a the method provided. But then again, I don't want my cat to bark, and I don't want my dog to meow, right? So what would be something that my mammal class could do in this instance? I could just do public. Void speak, right? And um, system out, system out print line. Um, speak. That doesn't really solve it for me, though. Because not all animals are going to use the same. A whale is going to go, right? I know, I'm being goofy. But uh, not all animals are going to make the same sound. So I have to be careful. We have to be careful how we implement the abstract method. The contract, we don't want to be implemented too soon. So one of the ways we can handle this is we could make our class mammal do me a favor here just take out uh, did I already do it yeah I already took it out of dog we can make our class mammal abstract now think about it that makes sense right we know a mammal is going to speak, but it's really too soon yet to say what a mammal is going to sound like. Right? A mammal may sound like a cricket. It may sound like a dog. It may sound like a horse, but we don't know yet. So we're still going to pass off how that mammal speaks down to the actual animal. So a cat, for example, well, a cat is going to be public, void, Speak, whoops, there we go, public void speak. Meow, right? And, um, and your dog, public void 
Well, we already have it down here, didn't we? We already implemented it. Okay. So we already got the implementation for the dog. A dog is going to bark. So we have this now, but let's go back to our main method. So now when I do something like um, cat speak or dog speak, we know it's going to produce different, it's going to output different things, right? Let's see what happens when we do it with a mammal. I'm very curious the behavior that's going to produce. And meow, bark, bark. Because we have the method that exists for mammal that the dog is going to produce. And the dog implementation produces the speak. All right. This is the beginnings of understanding how your inheritance and your interfaces and your abstract classes work. So if I go back to my mammal class, I don't have in here any specification about the, the, uh, the animal which requires speak. Okay. Yeah, it doesn't exist in here, right? But let, let's, um, let's talk a little bit more just real quick here about our abstract class. Abstract classes can have abstract methods. So I could also have public, abstract, void, eat. Okay, let me clear that up. Now, I have another contract I'm specifying, and I can specify this because it's abstract. The class itself is abstract. You cannot put this abstract method in a non-abstract class. And similarly, I can't implement the animal class without either having this class be abstract or implementing the speak method. Okay, this keyword is important in both instances. So what happens now? You, you'll notice that IntelliJ is presenting two problems. What do y'all think the two problems are? Well, this is, this is IntelliJ alerting us. This class here has no errors in it, okay? If you look at it, there's no, yeah. These are related problems. And if I click on it, the, the first related problem is going to be down at my, um, my cat. Because now cat must implement the contract that mammal provides, which is, which is eat. All right, so now I have to provide another method, public void eat. And um, what sound does a cat make when it eats? Huh? <laughs> no, cats don't purr when they eat, do they? That's not the sound that they, I don't know. Do they purr? I don't know. Um, Mo would go, the, the cat I used to have, Mo would go, hum, 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 hum. I was like, man, look at this cat. <laughs> num, num. Okay, so that's the sound a cat makes when it eats. All right, well, what about a dog? I feel like we're back in elementary school, right? All right, kids, what sound does a dog make? All right, um, so public. We got to implement it, implement the abstract method, public, void, eat. And the dog is going to make what, what sound? Non-stop. 
Okay, I like that. Chomp, chomp. All right. Let's go back to our mammal information. All right, so we could, of course, call on it and say the boony dog, when it eats, does that. The uh, boony cat does that. And the mammal, which is using the dog implementation, is going to do that. And I can call a mammal, right? Because this is my mammal class, I have a public abstract method. And it's going to rely on whoever is implemented to provide the information, the instructions. All right? So we'll run this again. Or my run, there it is. All right, so we have, we have all of the stuff going on. We have meow, bark, chomp, chomp, num, num, bark, chomp, chomp, right? Um, th this is all of these features that are being implemented, all right? All right, so we've talked about what this means somewhat, but let's, let's go over here for a second. Um, this eat and this speak, what they're really doing is called override, okay? That's what they're really doing. They're overriding the abstract method. Now this gets to another point. In, in um, object-oriented programming, in polymorphism, you have the idea of overriding, but you also have the idea of overloading. Okay, let's talk about overloading for a minute. Here's my cat. I'm going to do public void eat again. And immediately, you know, if I tried to compile this, the compiler is going to tell me the same thing that IntelliJ is saying. This method is already defined. You can't have two of the same method. Okay? Um, so overloading means we take the same method name and we add parameters. So we're going to provide um, an eating. Let's do. Uh, let's provide a parameter called number. Okay. And for my my number, I'm just going to give it a loop. For int i equals zero, i is less than the number i plus plus. And then right here, I'm just going to call the eat method. All right? So if I go back, I've got this overloaded method. There is no, um, there is no Syntax for that, no annotation, okay? Um, but by principle, you have a method that's overridden and you have a method that is overloaded, okay? And I'm just going to type this in there just for, um, for purposes that you can make sense of this when you look at it later, okay? override that's overloaded okay these are very important topics any questions so far any question okay I did not take um, um, attendance today oh, everyone's here. yeah everyone's here. is everyone here really yeah. I see you're winking all right. <laughs> Everyone's here, right, everybody? Yeah. All right. I'm trying my best, but I can't. The time keeps up. Thank you so much. Very good. Very good, sir. All right. So, 
Everyone understand the difference between override and overload? Yes. Let's, let's do another example for a cat overloading something. Let's overload one of the methods provided by the mammal. Okay, you can do this a couple of ways. Uh, you can click on the mammal class and you can pick a method or you can just click on generate and go to um, override. I'm sorry, I meant to say let's override another method. So let's go on override and click on um, the set fur color. Okay? Wait, set fur color. Yeah. So now we're going to override that method. And we could do something here. We could say string fur color is kind of purplish plus. Fur color. Let's change this to something else. Let's call this uh, there we go. My fur color. And then we'll pass that in here. In this instance, I'm overriding the default behavior and I'm doing it to what I want it to be. Right. Uh, this is this is a valid way of overriding a parent class, so that you still have the same behavior, but now you have it specific to what you want your cat to be, or whatever that method is. Right. Okay. Let's go back here for a moment. Go back to mammal information, and um, we could add to our boony cat. We could say, boony cat eats how many times? Ten times. And if we run that again, you're going to see a whole lot of uh, num nums. All right? Num 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 num. What's that song? There we go. All right. All right. So this is, this is kind of uh, an introduction into polymorphism, overriding, overloading. But there's one more uh, key principle here to this. Okay, let's, um, let's take out all of these methods for a moment. I'm just going to delete them. And I'm going to delete the front end of these implementations. Okay, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a, uh, an array list. Are you guys familiar with ArrayList now? Okay. And I'm going to say that my ArrayList accepts type mammal. Okay. All right. So... I have created an array list that accepts a type, a generic type of mammal. And what is mammal? There's my mammal right there, right? Mammal has an abstract method for eat. It has a name, it has fur color, it has all these, these properties, right? As well as it has, yeah. Right? It has all of that. All right, so let's, let's come over here and we're going to say mammal array list add. And I'm going to surround this with the parenthesis. So now I'm going to add a new dog to my mammal array list. Why can I do that? How is that possible? How is that possible for me to do that? Because a dog is a what? 
It is a mammal. So by the virtue it is that type, it can, it can, it can be added to a type of list that contains mammals. Now if we think about that again with our, our object up here on the board, when we specify a type, okay, and we store it in memory, there is a particular type. It's going to set aside in memory. And when I say there is an array list, it automatically specifies place in memory to hold so many types that you specify. Now, when we look at, say, uh, that is a specified type called string, and we're saying it's going to hold six places in memory. So it's literally like this. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that's what it will hold in memory. Okay? When we specify an array list, array list is special in that it is, it is like this, but it automatically, I think the default is that it automatically takes up 20 spaces in memory. It holds it automatically. So that when you specify your elements, it automatically takes up all the way to 20 of the same exact type over and over, over again in memory. So when you actually create an array list, you can specify as one of the parameters, the, you can pre-initialize it to the exact amount you want it to take up in memory. Now if we think about memory management, that's important, right? Because we're now saying that that is only going to take up X amount of spaces. If you don't supply it, by default it does that. Okay? And the creators of Java thought this was a large enough number but small enough to, to allow for it. What happens is when you use the dot add, it takes the type, whatever that might be, right? Inside those curly brackets we got specified over there. It takes that type and you're adding it to memory. And as you approach like 20 or 19, it automatically doubles this again and says, okay, we're going to add another 20 spaces in memory to hold it up. Okay? So the type in memory that we're using here is what type? It's the type of mammal, right? We could have specified an animal, but we have no implementation really types, no implement no really defined contract of an animal. We could still do it, but for our purposes, let's just add the animals, the mammals. Okay, so I'm gonna copy and paste this just to make it quick, okay? At the end, make sure you put your parenthesis, paste it again, because I wanna demonstrate what happens here. So I have three objects added, even though the two of them are dogs and one of them is a cat, they're all mammals. And so the rule is when I call the speak method for each of those, it's going to use the implemented contract. What is the implemented contract for a dog? Yeah, bark. What's the implemented contract for a cat? Right. Okay, so let's, let's put it to the test. I'm going to use a new type of for loop here. This is called a, um, a for each. So I'm going to use mammal as my type. And I'm going to just use m for short because we all know what it is. And, um, and then I'm going to supply it with my array list. Okay. And then for m, I'm going to say speak. And I'm also going to say m eat. Now, this is the part that sometimes bends your brain 
because you're thinking, well, how did it do that? Keep in mind that each time I loop through the array list, I'm taking, it's taking out one iteration out of that array list and it's assigning it to this variable m because it is that type. And as it, because it is that type, when I call speak, it's going to take the implementation of that type and give us the, the action. Okay? Everyone understands so far? No one understands? Getting there? This is why I said it's going to bend your brain a little bit. All right, so we're going to run it. And we can see it's called bark, chomp, chomp, meow, num, num, bark, chomp, chomp. It's looped through all of these objects and it's used the implementation type. Yeah. Someone ask a question. Because I know you have them. Something doesn't make sense. Tell me what doesn't make sense to you. Okay, so the for loop is, this is called a for each loop. You have the type, that's right here, and you have the list that's here. And it takes the, it takes the first element in that list and it assigns it automatically to the variable type. And this only works if they're all the same type, which all dogs are of type what? All right, so let's, what happens when we do something like this? Yeah, so now we know that all of these dogs and cats they're ultimately animals, but the uh, function, the interface up here does not have an eat contract, right? So it can't fulfill the contract. It can't fulfill the implementation here. So this is where I'm just going to comment it out. And when I comment it out, you're going to see it still works because it still calls the speak method for each of those implementations. Okay. All right. So think about practically how much you might, how might you use this in the real world? What might you do in the real world to implement something like this? What is a uh, Let's think about payroll. And your payroll is going to pay all persons. And so when the payroll job runs, it says go pay the person. So pay method is called and pay is abstract. Okay. Meaning it will go down the list and pay each person underneath that abstract. So uh, person is the abstract class, pay is the abstract method. The child classes that implement it could be student, could be faculty, could be staff. Each of those could be a person. And so we call pay on the payroll list, and it goes through each of those, and it says, okay, I'm paying the student, I'm paying the staff person, I'm paying the faculty. Yes. Right? Does it help a little bit to think about it that way? The, the implementation is not as important to the payroll class. It doesn't care how they're paid. But more as to where it goes to. Yeah, it cares how it's implemented. And so as long as there's an implementation, 
it does the work, right? So now you've, you've separated the scope of your work because if you had to, here's a good example, your game that you're making. You could have a hierarchy in your games. You could have the spell class, the punch class, the power kick, whatever, right, all of those. And they could have uh, an abstract method that they implement. And so when you call the, um, you call the, the spell, it could be a lightning, it could be, uh, it could be any of these other things. What calls it doesn't care what it what happens. It call it it what it what it does care about is that the method itself does exist and that it's implemented. It doesn't care how it's implemented, right? Yeah. I hire you for a job. I say here's the contract. Go do it. Now, of course, I care how you do it. Okay, but the way you do it may be different than the way Patricia does it, or maybe different than the way. Christian does it. The implementation may be different, but you all get the job done. You all fulfill the contract. Yes. Yeah. All right. How many of these brains are still bent? Yeah. On the sunny side of. All right. All right. So let's uh, let's take this a step further. All right. We have. An animal right here. Let's add what's called an anonymous class. Anonymous. So we're going to say mammal array list add new animal. And IntelliJ does something for you. You see what IntelliJ did? I can't, I can't create a new animal class because it doesn't have any implementation. But I can create it as an anonymous class. If I do, though, I have to provide the implementation at that time. See, this is, when I do this, I try to implement an abstract class or an interface. I'm doing it in an anonymous way. It becomes an anonymous implementation of it, okay? Sorry, sir, can you explain what makes this anonymous? It's anonymous in that it, does, it itself does not have... Um, Animal class doesn't have an implementation. It's a contract. And when I try to implement it on the fly, that implementation on the fly is called an anonymous class. That's just what we call it. You just have to, this type of implementation is called anonymous class. Yep. So you're saying that the anonymous class is in itself implemented within the mammal information that you can write its own thing within that class. Mm -hmm. On the fly. We just said, we're just going to implement this to cover it down. Right? Now, it only exists within that uh, class, the mammal information. Yep. Yep. Now we can take it a step further. We could have mammal information list. We can add a new mammal. Same thing happens. So now I have to implement two methods, and I also have to provide a constructor. Uh, I don't know what sound, what sound does a horsey make when it eats? I don't know. 
I don't know what a horse sound makes when he eats. Grind, grind, grind. All right. And what is a, you all know what a horse sound is, right? All right. You, what is the difference here? You, some of you may be confused by this. You're looking at this and going, why? Why for the animal do I only have to implement one method, but for the mammal I have to implement two? Can anyone tell me why? Exactly. Exactly, Christian. Mammal has two abstract classes. It has the eat abstract class, as well as it has what it inherits from its contract, the speak method. And so here I have to implement the contract for both of those. Okay? So if I run it again, we see, we see that, right? Now, I'm not calling down here the eat method because it doesn't exist for animal. Right? But I do down here. Uh, I mean, I, it does print out the speak version of it. Okay. Let's uh, let your brains rest for a moment. All right, let's create a new Java class. And um, we're going to call this person. Okay. And I don't want this person class to be extended. And the way I keep it from being extended is by putting the keyword final on it. So that can't be changed. Cannot be changed. Cannot be overridden or overloaded. It's final. Uh, you, proverbially, I'm putting my foot down. Right? This one will not change. All right. Um, I'm going to provide a um, constructor for it. So I'm going to say public person. By the way, um, I could make this a private person. And if I do that, then I have no way of implementing or creating the person object. But there is a way, and you guys are going to talk about it this week in your discussion forum, okay? And it's called singletons. And singletons are very powerful ideas in programming where you only want one instance to exist in memory at one time. Okay? And there's a way to do that, but you guys are going to have to research that this week. And you have to tell me why that's important as well. Okay? Uh, I'm going to start out here. I'm going to say my person is going to have a string first name. Whoops. String uh, middle name, string last name, string suffix. Okay? And then I'm going to create some methods, uh, some variables first. I'm going to have private final string first name private final what's it complaining about hang on I got it backwards again yeah okay I, never mind just ignore that for a moment we're going to fix that in just a second Okay. So this is middle name. This is um, 
last name, this is suffix, okay? And you can, you can see here that um, IntelliJ is complaining in advance for me. That's because I haven't initialized them. And it'll do that if I put final in front of it. So we're going to say this, first name equals first name. Notice that the squiggly line has gone away. Do this, middle name equals middle name. This, last name equals last name. This, suffix equals suffix. Okay, we've got everything here. Uh, I'm just going to move this up just a little bit so we keep it all the code visible on one line here. Okay, there we go. And then at the bottom, I'm only going to generate getters, okay? And I'm generating getters for all four of the variables in this class. All right? Everyone with me so far? Okay, I'm going to go ahead and click OK to that. Only generating getters. Okay, yes? You're just saying just have string name instead of all of those. Yeah, that, that is possible to do that, but generally for every database, you want to keep first name, middle name, and last name separate, as well as suffix. And um, when we're creating objects like this, we're thinking about in advance how something would be represented in a table. So if you're doing any type of querying, say I want to find all people by the last name of... Um, what is your last name, Cherry? Huh? What is your last name? If I was looking for anyone that had your last name, then it would be important that I have a separate field for that. So we want to try to map uh, the separation of these values as close to reality as possible. Okay? Yeah. But you're correct. We could just have one string. It says string name. But then... That's going to make it more difficult later on. Okay? All right. Everyone with me so far? Yes. Sir. Okay. This right now has nothing to do with polymorphism, okay? I'm laying out a scenario for you to introduce the topic of a record. Now, everything that I've done here, this is a lot of typing. Would you guys agree? Yeah. And the more I have to implement these types of um, classes, maybe I have a class that is about a course name. I would want to do it very much the same way. I'd want to have it be final. I don't want it to be changed or extended or anything like that. I want all of, I want everything to be created through the constructor so that it's immutable. There's no changing of the object once it exists in memory. All right, think again here on the board. What happens when I create an object with a constructor? It's this constructor creates that object in memory. And if I allow setters to go back and set this, I'm going to introduce all kinds of problems in memory. Okay. Um, best practice is if you have objects, you're going to create them like this. Okay, you want to keep them very, very well defined. All right, this is this is difficult to write over and over and over again. 
So Java, hearing the complaint of so many people saying it's too verbose, it's too much typing, uh, they came up with what's called the record class. Um, I have a course online on LinkedIn Learning, shameless plug. Okay. Uh, it's called it's called Project Lombok. Okay, and Project Lombok takes many of the things that you have to do in Java, and it it uses annotations to to satisfy it. Okay, Project Lombok. Yeah. Lombok. L-O-M-B-O-K. Yeah. Yeah. Project, P-R-O-J-E-C. Okay, you got that one. All right. So um, there, there is a lot of verbosity okay, in Java. For example, the Java contract on objects recommends that every class that you create, you override the two-string method. Right? So if I was to look at this right here, do you see a two string method? No. No, you don't. But guess what? By default, person extends object. By default, it extends object. And even if you have this on there or not, it doesn't matter. Okay? All classes you create, by default, they extend object, which means, come down here to the bottom of the screen, go to generate, go to override methods, and you can see all of the methods that you get for free from the object class. And one of them is the toString method. Now, if I click on this, um, it's going to do it like that, all right? It, and if we analyze what's in the two-string method, it's actually a um, it's a bytecode reference to where this object lives in memory at the time of creation. However, this is horrible when it comes to um, understanding what is in this object. If I have a two-string method, I actually want it to return things like this. I want it to return, you know, the, um, uh, the last name. First name. Let's see, I'm not going to do that. Middle name, suffix. That would make much more sense to me within this Java class. Okay? So if I wanted to uh, put the two string out in a system out print line, I would actually see what this object is when it's created. All right. Let's, let's just do that just real quick. I'm going to create another class. We'll call this uh, person information. And we'll do a public static void main method. And we'll have person, uh, person, this person equals new person. And I have to supply all of these variables. So I'm going to say... Michael D Rogers Jr. Right? Now if I do a system out print line of the person object it will automatically, any time you do a system out print line of the person object, or any object for that matter, is going to print the two string method. So let me give you an example real quick. We're going to create one other object. We're just going to call it object. Is object equals new object. 
and I'll do a system out print line of object. By default, the print line method calls the two string. Okay? So let's print this out just to see what we get. This is the default, which is the, uh, the memory location. It basically says this is the type of object it is, and this is the memory location, the bytecode information on it. Whereas on my example, because I've overridden the two-string method, it gives me a printout of that, of the details of the object. Okay? All right. So back to our person. The reason I'm going into all this detail here to talk about this object itself is there's many times that we have to create it this way and it's very verbose. The easiest way to do this, we're going to do a new Java class and we're going to select record and I'm going to call it um, we're going to call it student just for simplicity's sake. Okay. Make sure you new Java class, select record, give it the name, and this is your record. So we'll say string first name, string uh, middle name, string last name, string suffix. And it's five o'clock. All right. It is time. So we got to quit. But this, for all intents and purposes, is equal to all of this. Okay? That is when you use the record. All right. Guys, I'm going to let you go. And